Thank you all for being here today. So as Dr. G was mentioning to you all, we have spent the better part of a year trying to understand why the reorganization of regulations in ground, of groundwater in Texas, why this, this should matter to us. And so our first point is, is that the water demand in Texas, our red line here, uh, we see goes from about 17 million acre feet in 2010 to around 23 million acre feet uh, in 2060. Whereas in 2010, we had a water, a water supply, our blue line, of 17 million acre feet in, in, in 2010, and we see that go down to about 15 mil million acre feet in 2016. So this leaves us with a very large 8 million acre foot gap between wa water demand and water supply by 2060, and that is, is, is a lot. And so for this reason, the, T the TWDB has predicted a, wa a water shortage and um, a decline in ground groundwater production uh, over this period of time. And so one of the things that we spent a lot of time trying to, um, to find out is whether this, this shortage is a physical shortage based on the, um, on the capacity of the aquifer, or is this a regulation-induced uh, induced shortage? And um, what can be done, uh, whether this is physical or a regulation issue, what, what can be done about this? And so we started here with the nine major aquifers in Texas. And um, I'm sure all of you know what the nine ma major aquifers here if you're here, but um, I won't go, go through them. But um, this was the total basis for our research were the nine major aquifers in Texas. Now, we wanted to start off trying to, uh, trying to understand whether this was a physical sh shortage of water. And to do this, we felt that we needed to see how, how much water we actually have left um, based on 50% uh, TERS. And so we realized that the, T, the TWDB measures TERS between 25% and 75%, but we wanted to choose a safe, uh, safe bet with like 50%. And so um, for those of you that aren't as, um, aren't, aren't as up on what TERS is, um, so think of a big barrel, and there's, wa there's a lot of wa water in this barrel, and there's recharge going in, and then there is consumption leaving. And so we wanted to find out how many years it, it would take for this barrel to reach 50% um, based on those, on those two things. And so before I move on, I just wanted to note that we did um, start with the Gulf Coast because it is our biggest aquifer based on 50% TERS all the way to our smallest down here. And then we also wanted to note that the Gulf Coast serves, uh, serves Houston, where the Trinity does not serve D DFW, but it is located in that area. And the Carrizo Wilcox, which serves the greater San Antonio area. So to find out how much time we have left, we decided to make three, three assumptions on, on consumption. And starting with our blue line here, we wanted to see how long it would take for each aquifer to reach 50% of its TERS if, if, uh, if consumption remains completely constant, remains the same over, over the years. And then our green line here, we wanted to also see how long it would take to reach 50% TERS based on the historical trends um, of aquifer water uh, consumption. And then our red line here, this was a worst case, worst case uh, situation, what if the aquifer, if we were consuming wa water by 2% per year, um, what, what, what would this do and how long would it take to reach 50% TERS? So starting with our blue line, these big three here, we see that if, um, if, if consumption remains the same, then we will have an Unlimited supply, and what we mean by that is it would take 10,000 years or, or more to reach that 50% uh, threshold, um, or many years left. Whereas with our special case, the Ogallala has about 35 years, but we do recognize that there are some major, uh, major specialties there. And then our green line, if, um, if consumption progressed how it has in the past, uh, we would see much of the same thing as, uh, as before, that we would have that 
uh, un uh, unlimited amount of time until we reached 50% uh, of TERS and then ma many years uh, for the uh, Trinity Aquifer. Now, with 2%, we see a rather large jump. Um, of course, we just wanted to throw out there this worst case, you know, what could happen in a, in a very bad situation. Um, we would see that it would take just about two, 200 plus years for the big three to reach that 50% uh, threshold. And then all of the others are, um, are not doing so hot in that case. Uh, so our point here is, is that if there is not this physical, short, uh, physical shortage of water, which we see by the many years that we have until the big three reach 50% uh, of TERS, then we felt like we needed to investigate further in the regulation sh shortage side of things. And that all started with this map right here, the 100 GCDs in Texas. And our point is, is that each of these little blocks that we see on this map work as a, um, as a country unto themselves. Um, it's a very difficult process to get, to get the, ground the groundwater to move from its, uh, to its highest and best use with the way that, um, that the regulatory system is set up now. And what we found was that this process works in two ways. It works in theory and it works in practice. In theory, we see that the uh, GCDs would create a scientifically based DFC, what it would want the, uh, their aquifer to look like over the next uh, 50 years. And then these would turn into a a uh, hydrology model followed by um, a mag and then which is basically saying how how much wa how much water do we want to use over this 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 DFC this time period what's the drawdown what's the what's the numeric val value that we assign to the DFC and then this mag would be the basis for for fu for future permits in the uh, in the GCD but in practice what we see is a bit uh, is a bit backwards from this. We see the uh, GCDs come uh, come and talk with the local uh, local pumpers, local special uh, interest groups to find out how how much they need, and then they take this and then they uh, send it to the TWDB, and they would use this to cut to calculate um, the draw the drawdown, the DFC, and the mag. Um, and then they would use what is created here for the basis of their future permits. And to show this, we chose um, three, three, three different uh, G GCDs. And if you're one of them, you're not in trouble, but we just wanted to, to choose three. Um, so what we did was we showed how mags are set well, well, well below what they could be. And so in the blue bonnet, we took the, the potential production, what we have deemed through our research is uh, going to be safe uh, for, the, uh, for the aquifer. And then we uh, divided it by its current mag. So the blue, the blue bonnet could have a mag that is three, three times what it is now. And then the, um, the uh, evergreen could have one that is 1.5 times its mag now. And then the Natchez Trinity Valley could have 15 times what it has now. So we also want, wanted to show from this what, oh, sorry, the laser crazy, um, what could the growth be from this? And so we took, again, p uh, potential production and divided it by the, uh, the, the consumption in 2010. And what we saw was that the blue bonnet could grow by 18.8 times, the, um, the evergreen by three times, and the Natchez Trinity Valley by 21 times. And from here, my colleague, Wayne Beckerman, is going to continue the introduction. Great. So building off what Kayla just presented us with, we see that not only are mags overly conservative, but groundwater isn't really moving within the state of Texas. It's staying in these small pockets. And obviously, that's not a legal thing to prevent exportation. So there are small, different little ways in which GCDs use to keep that groundwater in a specific area. One of those ways is by cutting permits overall so you don't have economies of scale. You have a lot of really small pumping permits rather than larger ones where people could use that water to export it out. You also have discriminatory export fees. One example in the Blue Bonnet GCD 
I believe it's fifty-five dollars per acre foot for the water that leaves the district. Whereas agricultural producers might have zero; they might not pay anything. So you have a lot of discrimination between the prices there, and then you also have legal disputes. One example is you can look at Clayton Williams in West Texas, how if you change the usage of water and you might want to sell it to a city, your permit might be denied. So there's a lot of smaller, simpler ways where the exportation is being controlled there. If we were to make MAGs less conservative and we were to allow the exportation, one side effect of that would obviously be a lot more pumping. So this example right here shows you a possible negative effect of increased pumping. What we have is we have Farmer Jones right here, and we have Farmer Smith. So if we look at the initial water level, say today, they're both pumping and water is just fine. They both have access to groundwater right there. But if we allowed more pumping and that water was being exported, we would see the water level go down. So we have 5% dewatering right here. And at that point, you see Farmer Smith simply has to lower his pump. That comes with the cost, makes groundwater more expensive, but he's going to be able to benefit because he's going to be able to sell his water other places. So Farmer Smith is going to be a beneficiary of this, of this new policy, but we see Farmer Jones, his well's gone dry. Um, so he can't lower his pump anymore, he's hit the bottom. That's why each of the policies that you're going to be presented with today have a mitigation portion to them. So we're going to be able to help the folks over here like Farmer Jones who there are going to be some people who don't benefit from this, but overall we're going to have more farmer smiths who simply have to lower their pump, but they're going to be able to sell water all over the state and they're going to economically benefit from that. One of the benefits we're going to see from making water more movable is we're going to see actually decreased consumption, decreased demand here. And what, what happens is over a 20 year period, because the price of water rises, you would think that the price of water would go down, but it's actually going to rise because the associated cost with lowering your pump is going to make water more expensive. So you're going to see people more cognizant of that water usage as they pay higher prices. People are going to be paying a price for their water that actually reflects its value. So over a 20-year period, we're showing this blue area right here is the water that would have been pumped that, that actually stays in the ground. So there's a, there's a conservation aspect to this as well by allowing water to move. Finally, our, our four policy options, there's, there's a route to each of them. The first one, we, it's an iteration of what we saw in the Post Oak Savannah GCD of having water as a property right. That's how we read the jurisprudence and everything through the court system is that water is, groundwater is a property right and we looked at the Post Oak Savannah's uh, allocation process and that's where policy option one comes from. Policy option two, we've had a lot of folks tell us how different all these aquifers in our state are. So what we, what we did through that one is manage each aquifer and the water within those aquifers differently. Obviously the Carrizo, Wilcox, and the Ogallala, very different. So this policy option focuses on the differences between aquifers and manages water on an aquifer by aquifer basis. Option three, we looked at the Railroad Commission model. We've had several folks bring this to our attention, that the Railroad Commission has, over a long period of time, been able to manage oil and gas on a state level, and so we looked at the possibility of managing groundwater from a state level perspective. And finally, option four, groundwater bank accounts. This is the idea that specifically the water under your land, you will own that, that amount of water and that amount of water will be managed by an outside, essentially a banking authority. And this comes from an idea by Nobel laureate Vernon Smith that he introduced a long time ago. This is a, it's a very unique option that we're going to go into more detail about. And again, we, what we did is we, after we had these policy options done, the entire group graded each option. So we all essentially voted on which ones we thought were the best. And we created a scorecard. I believe that's been passed out to you. And those four, the, the four criteria that we used to grade them were one, again, the protection of property rights. We read through jurisprudence and statute and we saw that there was a clear connection between groundwater and property rights. So that, that was at the top of our list. Using water's highest and best use is our economic factor and being able to see if water was going where it was most economically needed. Then we have managing aquifers in a prudent manner. That deals with reconciling how water is being used in a particular area today with how it needs to be used in the future and, and bridging the gap between those two situations. And lastly, how we had in Farmer Smith and Farmer Jones example, the mitigation of losses, because there will be some people who will unfortunately lose out in this system, but again, each policy option is gonna have a component that will make up for that and will leave those people not as worse off as they've been just out there. 
And now I'm going to introduce my colleague, Ross Brady, who's going to discuss policy option one. Thank you. So I worked on policy option one along with Wayne Beckerman, who you just heard of, and Amber Caps to my left here. And this option maintains the existing GCD structure while reinstating groundwater as a property right. Legally, groundwater has always been a property right, but in practice, it's not been treated this way with the situation that my peers just described, where GCDs can charge different prices for different uses and um, can accept or deny permits based on those uses also. And so the landowner is not as empowered to use their water as they wish to. To um, correct this, the, this system would have permits be issued regardless of use and a uniform and non-discriminatory fee structure. It would also involve um, mandatory metering to make sure that the landowners themselves are cooperating in allowing everyone to have their equal and fair share. And the um, return of groundwater as a property right would allow people to buy and sell their water rights, opening up a market for it. The way we'll ensure that each landowner has their equal and fair share is through a mathematical system with a two-part formula. The first part that you can see here takes 0.1% TERS, or one-tenth of 1%, 1 um, which also equals 5% TERS over 50 years, um, and adds that to estimated annual recharge. And this is how the GCDs would determine their MAG. Then to get the actual um, individual's allocation, we will use a correlative system um, that could be the lesser of two things. The individual landowner will either have their MAG divided by the total permitted surface acres for the GCD, or will be capped at two acre feet per surface acre, which is um, a model based on the Post Oak Savannah GCD, which we then um, went and spoke to agricultural producers and industrial users to see if this would be a feasible amount of water and um, receive positive feedback from there. A step-by-step -step process of how this works can be seen here. First, the GCD would determine its MAG. Then the individual landowners would submit their <coughs> permits for pumping, and the GCD would determine the total number of permitted surface acres in their GCD. The GCD would then calculate their correlative factor with the second formula that you've seen, and the individual landowners would receive their allocations. A visual example of how this would work in a GCD where the number of permitted surface acres is increasing each year is seen here also. So you can see on the right the permitted surface acres, on the left the pumping in thousands of acre feet, and that this GCD's total mag would be 600,000 acre feet. In year zero, um, only 100 surface acres are being pumped, and so the mag for this GCD would be six, or the correlative factor would be six acre feet per surface acre, and so instead, the, in each user would be capped at two acre feet per surface acre. With the steady growth of 100 acre feet per, year, um, per 10 year period in this GCD, you can see there would be year, in year 30, where the correlative factor finally becomes less than the cap at two acre feet, and that amount would be reduced. Obviously, in a scenario like this, so uh, perhaps an, an ur more urban GCD, um, where the number of permitted acres is increasing each year, that also means that the, they would be tapping into the TER as part of that formula. And so there's the possibility that some people's wells would need to be lowered or um, would need to dig new wells altogether. And that's where this mitigation that Wayne mentioned comes in. Uh, these GCDs would all have a mitigation fund built into them that would be funded in two ways. First, it would be through a one-time um, application fee, which is paid when each landowner submits their permit to pump, and that can be seen in this column here. And then second would be an annual usage fee, which is charged with the number of acre feet per, um, the number of acre feet being pumped. And that would be divided at a two-thirds, one-third ratio between the administrative fund for that GCD and their mitigation fund. So in, in this example, we have a 10-year time period, once again, with steady growth in permitted acres of 100 new acre, um, acre feet being added each year, uh, or surface acres, as I, as I was. And so you can see that with those 100 new surface acres being added each year, there are $1,000 being put in each year. And all of that money goes to the mitigation fund, because it's presumably the new pumpers entering the market who are creating the need for mitigation. Then the usage to fee is divided between the administrative fund, so 200 of these $300 are going here, and 100 goes to that mitigation fund. And so in the right-hand column, you can see how that fund grows over years until it comes to the time where it's ready to be used. The positive attributes of the system are the ending of the reverse engineer DFC MAG process by replacing it with that mathematic-based system you saw previously. 
using correlative rights and proportionate sharing of cutbacks to ensure that each landowner will have their equal and fair share of water, allowing water markets to emerge and creating fee-based incentives for efficiency and mitigation through those usage fees you saw in the previous slide. Obviously, no scenarios without problems or setbacks, though, and so a few that we've identified here. The first would be the possibility for non-compliant GCDs. Obviously, this would be a shift in the way they're governed, and so um, there's a possibility that they may not be willing to cooperate. In this way, the TWDB would continue its role as a monitor and supporter of the system and would be able to step in if that was seen to be the case. Likewise, individuals may not be willing to cooperate, especially landowners who don't want to have metering on their property. And so in order to make this as painless as possible for them, it would be um, the metering would allow for online submissions of the annual usage and um, spot checks not to occur more than every three or four years so that people would not be coming on the individual's land very often. Also, there are wide areas in the state. Kayla showed you the map of the 100 existing GCDs. And I know you're all familiar with it. And obviously, there are some areas that are not currently governed by any GCD. And in these areas, the rule of capture still applies. In order to ensure that each landowner has their fair share, you can't have some areas on the same aquifer continuing to operate under the rule of capture. And so these white areas would either need to be incorporated into existing GCDs or form one of their own. And then finally, there's a need for education. We've talked about the fact that there is more groundwater existing in the state than, there's, than is perceived. And so we would, would propose a dual-pronged education for adult education through the GCDs themselves and through the Agricultural Extension Service and youth education through forage and FFA programs. And a potential unintended consequence of this program would be negative impacts to the aquifer. Obviously, TERS is a controversial subject, and if you're tapping into it, you could be depleting the aquifer. That is why first we have the cap at two acre feet per surface acre, which means that in most cases, until you get to that point, you are not using the TERS part of that formula at all. But additionally, at the micro level, the individual level, we have those mitigation funds for the people who are, um, their portion of the aquifer is used up. They're at the shallow area and they need to either lower their well or construct a new well. And then at the GCD level, there is the ability to adjust the percent of TERS that's used and there's the built-in checkpoint after 50 years um, and so that would also allow them to adjust the formula to be whatever is healthy and sustainable for their aquifer. And now Peyton McGee will speak a little bit about policy option two. So policy option two, um, we'll look at aquifer-wide management. And there are a lot of similarities between option one and option two. The primary difference here is that we're going to be basing regulation off of hydrological boundaries as opposed to political boundaries. Now, there will be eight major aquifer authorities covering all the major aquifers of Texas, excluding the Edwards Aquifer Authority, which has already been formed uh, as a result of federal law. Each aquifer authority will have one central board consisting of seven members. Uh, three of these members will be appointed by the governor. We took that model from how many of the current uh, river authorities are, are formed. And four of these board members will be elected by county commissioners. And there will be four districts for each aquifer, and uh, the county commissioners will be in charge of electing these board members. And finally, regulation will be based on a acre foot per surface acre basis to place an emphasis on uh, water as a property right. So the MAG system will work the same as under policy option one. Uh, the primary difference here is that each sub aquifer region will have its own recharge recharge allocation, um, which is a more accurate representation than under the current GCD system. Currently, each GCD has their own recharge rates. Um, we will have management groups based off of these sub-aquifer regions. They will be in charge of local enforcement and monitoring test well conditions. And each aquifer board will be in charge of establishing fair and impartial regulations. And they'll do this uh, through two principles. The first is they'll have to form uniform fee structures throughout the aquifer. Um, each aquifer board will have its own autonomy to establish its own fee structure the way it thinks is best. Um, however, they have to say, they have to give the same rules for everyone under their jurisdiction. The second principle is that there will be no, they will not be allowed to discriminate amongst uses. So currently we see some GCDs discouraging water export that won't be allowed under this scenario. And finally, we'll have a mitigation fund similar to option one. So we've identified several positive attributes of this model. 
The first is it will provide certainty for long-term development, and this will be the result of using fair and impartial regulation and not allowing uh, the regulatory authorities to prohibit water export. Um, you'll see some of the differences between adjacent GCDs rec reconciled because um, we will be basing this authority on uh, hydrological boundaries. And finally, we will be respecting all property rights because we will be allocating water on an um, acre foot per surface acre basis. So we did identify some issues that could come as a result of this. Um, a loss of local control does have some positive and some negative attributes. Um, while there will be less local bureaucracy, as, as we currently see, um, there still will be some local representation based on uh, the elected representatives. Uh, additionally, under the Aquifer Authority model, um, there will be some difficulty um, managing some mitigation issues. They could become overlooked because you have a larger authority. And finally, some cities may have to at least additional water rights under this model. Um, but because uh, water export will not be discouraged, they will have an easier time uh, finding these additional water rights. Okay, and finally, we identified some un potential unintended consequences of this model. Uh, the first is that there's always the potential for people to fals falsify metering reports. And because you have a larger jurisdiction, it will be a little bit more difficult to identify. But this will be combated through uh, penalties as well as frequent spot checking. Um, and, and there could be un some other unforeseen consequences such as subsidence or certain mitigation issues, but having an aquifer-wide authority will allow greater flexibility to deal with these issues. And Braden Kennedy will discuss policy option three. Xu Ting and I had the opportunity to work on uh, policy option number three, which is the idea of having a single statewide agency regulate groundwater. This idea came to us because of the success the Texas Railroad Commission has had regulating oil and gas on the state level. <clears throat> this could happen uh, one of, or a few different ways. We suggest that uh, this new responsibility be, would be placed as a new branch in the Texas Water Development Board. Um, however, this responsibility may be too much and it would require the formation of a new statewide groundwater agency. Um, either way, uh, this agency would be required to uh, protect and conserve groundwater while also respecting uh, property rights. <clears throat> Moving from local control to state control um, or straight state regulation, um, it's important to look at how this agency would be uh, managed. Uh, currently, the TWDB has three governor-appointed uh, board members, and with this new responsibility, it's important that this agency be more representative of the people of Texas. Uh, so we suggest that these board members be chosen through alternating statewide elections. Uh, next, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, state agency would organize Texas into 16 regions, which would each have a district office. Currently, the TWDB has 16 GMAs that are uh, based off similar hydrologic features, which would work well for what we're trying to do. Um, these district offices would be responsible for collecting uh, metering reports, um, overseeing monitoring wells in their region, and also um, just enhancing the communication between the water user and the state agency. Mandatory metering is crucial. These district offices would be the ones responsible for collecting those metering reports organizing the data and then sending that to Austin. Um, in, order to, um, in order to conserve these, uh, the groundwater, protect property rights, and also ensure the safety of pumping, uh, the state agency would issue water permits and also collect um, a uniform non-discriminatory fee. When issuing these water permits, uh, a couple things that this, these permits would consider. First is the safety of pumping, specifically in areas of land subsidence. Uh, this would allow subsidence districts to dissolve as well, saving more local and state resources. Um, also, just like oil and gas, we would have spacing rules to protect neighboring landowners from uh, excessive drainage or cones of depression. Uh, the amount of land is considered because uh, the landowners with a, a large amount of land will have more natural resources, more groundwater underneath that land. Um, hydrological makeup is considered because aquifers act differently from one another. 
and they may act differently in one part of the aquifer than it would elsewhere in the same aquifer. And finally, aquifer conditions uh, is considered uh, because full and abundant aquifers can have less stringent regulation than the depleting aquifers would require. So after a landowner is granted his water permit, uh, he'll pay a one-time permit fee um, that lasts the entirety of the life of the permit. And then he'll pay a annual usage fee based on the amount of acre feet uh, pumped from his land each year. These permits would also uh, define a radius of transferability. Uh, these uh, water users will be able to buy and sell additional pumping rights uh, within uh, areas of similar aquifer conditions. A few positive attributes that this policy option offers. Uh, first, looking, viewing water from a statewide perspective, instead of restricting the lens to small district lines, you'll be able to identify areas of need and areas of abundance and encourage trading between the two. Um, also, um, you would re be regulating the entire state and as opposed to leaving uh, white spots where there are no GCDs or are no uh, major aquifers. Um, also, you'd be, you'd be working with one state agency that would house many hydrologists and many uh, water experts who can work together to create sound scientific-based regulations. And if there's areas across the state where they need more information on what's occurring underground, they can have monitoring wells installed where the district offices would re uh, record this information, send it back to Austin, and these hydrologists would be able to create greater models of what's occurring underneath Texas. Uh, finally, uh, GCDs currently uh, don't have access to the resources to mitigate harmed landowners. Um, a statewide agency would collect funds on a much larger scale and would be able to do so. Also, uh, in takings cases or any uh, litigation, a state agency would be more capable to handle those lawsuits as well. Um, Peyton mentioned falsifying metering reports or spotting the cheaters. Um, this may be an even greater issue with policy option three because the regulators are even further removed from uh, the water users. Um, having uh, strict enforcement or uh, large fines would play an even greater role in the success of policy option three. Um, also, moving away from local control uh, can be problematic. Um, this was addressed by having that accountability aspect of having board members statewide elected. Um, however, people still want to control their water. Um, in many cases, local politics have proven to be problematic in uh, the way GCDs operate, so a statewide agency would remedy that issue. Um, regulatory capture, uh, unintended consequence. Uh, a statewide agency would not be immune to lobbyists and powerful um, water users. Um, on one hand, you can have the conservationists who want the strict regulation and the water marketers who, who want to produce the water and get it traded right now, and then the people who want that access to the groundwater, but they don't want you anywhere near their land disturbing their water. So you'll have a, you'll have a lot of different sides competing for, um, competing for the interest of the statewide agency. Next, Mason Parrish is going to talk about the groundwater banking account. Thank you, Braden. Abdullah and I had the opportunity to work on policy option number four, which is the groundwater bank account system. As Wayne mentioned earlier, uh, this system uses market features to be able to manage the aquifer. Under our current system, property rights are not well defined, resulting in an incentive to pump the water before your neighbor. However, under the Texas groundwater bank account system, property rights are clearly defined by identifying the exact amount of water that each individual owns. This creates an incentive to conserve and something that we think is extremely important and also unique uh, to this policy option. Additionally, underneath the system, we're going to make sure to promote conservation, as we spoke to earlier, and we're going to create um, scarcity in our market, and which will result in a market for the groundwater bank account system. This system is going to utilize local control by using groundwater conservation districts. They're going to be our boots on the ground, executing the bank account system daily. In addition, we'll be creating groundwater bank account authorities. These groundwater bank account authorities will allow for comprehensive aquifer management. So as we look at the system and try to describe how it works, the best way is to take a look at our bank account statement that will be provided to account holders each year. This is much like a statement that you receive every month from your bank account or your bank. As we take a look at it, we see common features such as property information, 
in addition to the bank account or the groundwater conservation district authorizing the account and our previous year's balance. As we take a deeper look though, we see an opening balance of 3,000 acre feet, leaving us with the question of how do we result in this initial water allocation? To get our initial water allocation, our team used Texas Water Development Board models, which are already created, and model the aquifer on a one mile square basis. We then take a look at your piece of property. So as a property owner, imagine that you own 40 acres. Take the perimeter of that 40 acres and draw a column directly underneath your piece of property. That initial amount of water will take 5% of to result in your initial allocation of water. You can use that 5% of that total water underneath your piece of property however you like during 50 year period. At the end of the 50 year period, if you still have water left inside of your account, that water rolls over to the next planning horizon resulting in an incentive to conserve. In addition, at the end of that 50 years, we're going to be able to take a uh, comprehensive view of the aquifer and determine if the integrity of the aquifer is still there. If so, we can apply another 5% or we can apply less in the future. Now that we have our 3,000 acre feet of water, the question is what we'd like to use it on. As we take a look at this bank account statement, we see yearly pumpage for year 2021 through 2025. As you can see, we have debits of 100, 150, 75, and 80. This is just like you going to a store and swiping your debit card. Each one of those transactions represents withdrawals from your account. In addition, as we look at this recharge credit in 2025, we see what would be a paycheck in our current system. So what we're going to do periodically is apply recharge credits to our accounts. In this case, it was every five years. These recharge credits will be based on two things. Number one, the amount of recharge to the aquifer. And then number two, that recharge is going to be based proportionally amount of, off the amount of water that you received initially. So how water saturated your piece of property sits over. As we continue through our bank account, we see an interesting transaction in 2027 where this individual, which is brown, uh, decided to sell water to Jones. As we look at these kind of transactions, we see that water is going to be transferring from one place to the next. And during this kind of transaction, we see a debit of 100 and a credit of 100, showing an equal transaction across the two. There are going to be two different types of transactions, though, in this kind of a market. As we look at these transactions, we can imagine that one of these transactions could take place with an individual here on this side of the aquifer, or this side of the GCD, and another individual on this side. It's because of that geographical distance, under, distance underneath this transaction that the water right is going to have to be pumped from the place in which it originated. So in those cases, we wouldn't be able to transfer the water right over to that new location and pump from the new location. However, as we continue these kind of transactions and we see examples such as Smith and Brown, we notice because of the transmissivity of the aquifer in addition to the geographical closeness that the water is going to transfer from those two different locations. In this example, whenever water is sold from one location, such as Smith to Brown, the water rights will be able to be pumped from that new location, allowing for another incentive for trade and also making it less, comp uh, less cumbersome. Even though we've created these water transfer zones to help with this kind of a process, and we're going to use well spacing, there will be opportunities and uh, just uh, examples in which a well will run dry. In those cases, we're going to apply the mitigation fund discussed earlier in option one. This mitigation fund is similar, exactly similar to option one using cost sharing and local control through groundwater conservation districts. Our mitigation fund will be funded through usage fees. As we go back to our <laughs> bank account statement, we see one last transaction in 2028. When we see that this account holder decided to sell 200 or 2,540 acre feet of water to a nature conservancy. We think that this speaks to the idea of conservation in this option. As we look at conservation, we realize that as we define property rights, we're creating an incentive to save, buy, and also sell water, but also we're internalizing some of those costs associated with using water. Uh, we also are going to be promoting the prudent management of our aquifer and create a new role for nature conservancies who can use the market features to be able to take water out of production and be able to save it for the future. We believe that this policy option promotes conservation through well-defined property rights and telling individuals the exact amount of water in which they own. As we look to implement new policies, we need to make sure to pay attention to the unintended consequences that could be associated. The first that we'd like to discuss is agricultural users. In a perfectly competitive market, such as agriculture, 
Uh, profit margins aren't large. And as we ask new producers or large irrigators to increase their cost of production by paying for more water, it could result in irrigators not being able to compete with their neighbors in other states and also in a global economy, other nations. We do need to mention, though, that underneath this system, agricultural users who usually have a decent amount of land are going to have a new revenue source, and that is selling water. So that trade-off just needs to be um, compared and also considered. Additionally, municipalities who do not sit over a water-saturated area will have to go out and they'll have to procure water rights or lease water rights uh, to be able to service their residents. This could increase costs to be able to provide water to residents. And then finally, we believe that an unintended consequence of this policy option is certainty but also flexibility. We believe we will provide some, flex some certainty, uh, allowing for development and growth as this 50-year planning horizon is utilized, allowing um, account owners to know exactly how much water they have and be able to plan within that 50-year horizon. However, it creates flexibility. At the end of that 50-year period, we'll be able to reevaluate re and determine if the aquifer is in a good position and make the right moves. At this time, I'd like to ask Abdullah to come speak on po our policy matrix. Thank you, Mason. Uh, as stated earlier, Wayne mentioned, we'll be evaluating all these policies based on these four criteria. So the criteria are protecting all property rights, highest and best use, uh, mitigation of rising costs and pruder, uh, prudent aquifer management. These grades were actually given by once we all went through the study, completed the study, each individual gave the grades and then this is the average grade that we have assigned for each policy option and we have compared that to the existing system. First of all, we'll go through the protecting all property rights. The proxy that we have used for that criteria is whether everyone is getting fair and equal chance to get uh, access to water. And for that reason, we gave uh, all the options are doing better than the existing ones. The only reason the groundwater bank account idea gets a greater grade because it doesn't treat water as homogeneous good because each property has is blessed with different amount of water. So that's the reason why it gets the better grade because it's get, it get, gets that part right. Then we'll go to the highest and best use. The proxy that we have used for highest and best, best use is the transferability of water from water abundant areas to water scarce areas. How easy it is to get transfer waters from that one region to another region. And the reason we have got uh, option three and option four uh, better grade is because with increase in balkanization, the, it, the chances reduces. And with regards to mitigation of rising costs, uh, we have the, the fund that will work, uh, that will take care of that, uh, that, that problem. And lastly, we have prudent aquifer management. The reason that option three gets the better grade is because it takes the holistic view of all, the, all state and all aquifers. At the end of the day, everything beneath the ground is interconnected. So if you have a, a statewide look, you can always make a better decision and see how the hydrology works and how different interaction is happening beneath the ground. So that's one of the reasons why option three gets the better grade. With regards to political feasibility, we have intentionally left that open because I, we believe you are at the, better, at the best position to look at the political landscape and see the effectiveness and the chances of each policy option. So we would like you to actually go through each of the policies and make that decision because we don't think we, we can do that for, 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 the, for all these options. So we've passed on the policy matrix for each one of you and if you ca can fill that out, that'll be great. And this whole options are just to initiate a conversation so that w we all can discuss about the problem. And this is our attempt, and we would like to thank you for coming and attending our presentation, and we would open the floor for questions. Thank you very much.